You got one of those from 30 years ago? The tape keeps playing. The video keeps playing. And I can't make it stop playing. Neither could David. Your sin, my sin, there, there. It's always there. It's there when I get up. It's there when I go to bed. He didn't have to say that. Number two. The exceeding sinfulness of his sin is that it was a sin. It was sin only against God. Verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned and done what was evil in your sight. Really? Nathan had said to David, Why have you despised the word of God? Why have you scorned the Lord? David picks up on that focus. The point here is not that Bathsheba wasn't hurt, Uriah wasn't hurt, the baby wasn't hurt, the kingdom wasn't hurt, all of his heirs weren't hurt. That's not the point. The point is what makes sin sin is that it's against God. Sin, by definition, is against God. That's what sin is. We hurt people. We sin against God. The meaning of sin in the Bible is, I've offended God, I've assaulted God, I've belittled God. And that's what he's saying. I've hurt Bathsheba big time. I've killed Uriah. The baby's dead on my account. My heirs are always going to have a sword. Look what happened. Absalom, Adonijah, just weep when I look at the record of this man's life because I've got sons. I don't want an Absalom. I don't want an Adonijah among my sons. Nothing would be more heartbreaking, wouldn't it? And that's all an outcropping of this horrible thing. So his second way of intensifying his sin is to say sin is sin because it's against God. Number three, David vindicates God and not himself. There's no self-justification. There's no self-defense. There's no escape. Verse four at the second half of the verse. So that you may be, so that you, God, may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. A born-again, guilt-ridden, person confesses with emotional credibility, I deserve to be damned, and God damning me would be just, period. That's what born-again people feel about the way they treat their spouses, feel about their failure with their kids, feel about the little white lies I heard talked about on NPR this afternoon. How do you feel? Is sin a light thing to you? Or is the gap between your godliness and God's holiness so great that you know if God sent you to hell, he would have done the exactly right thing and he would be blameless in his judgment? So David is simply drawing attention to the fact, if I am saved by mercy, God will have gone way beyond what I deserve. Number four, finally, uh, after turning helpless to the mercy of God, that's number one. Number two, praying for forgiveness and cleansing. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm starting to give you point four when I haven't finished number three yet. I've got, I've got a number five under number three, and I skipped it. I don't want to skip it. David admits that he didn't just sin against an external law. He sinned against light in his own heart. And I see that's number five, and I didn't give you number four. <laughs> But I'll give you number five, and then I'll do number four. Number six, verse six, 
Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. The point there is, I've got in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery, and I've got in the Ten Commandments, you shall not murder, and I've got in the Ten Commandments, you shall not lie. And of course, I've sinned by failing to live up to those words from God. But this text says, you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. David was wise. He had done so many wise things. God had been his teacher. God had led him in so many ways. His life had been blessed. And that made his sin all the more horrible. That's why James 3 says, let not many of you become pastors and teachers because the judgment of us who spend all of our time in the Bible is going to be way stricter than with you. I was thinking about that with my wife today. Every time I get mad at my wife, I have to remind myself, I study the Bible a lot more than Noel does. Therefore, even my slightest dishonoring words are more guilty than hers. Number four, that was five, this is four. You can number them any way you want. (laughs) I'm giving you... This is the last one under number three, that he intensifies his guilt in these ways. So here it is. He draws attention to his inborn corruption, verse 5, his inborn corruption. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, lots of people take that truth to lessen their sin, not intensify it. I'm just this way. Big sex drive, bent towards lying, never was, you know, I never liked soldiers very much anyway. And therefore, my acting on those impulses is not as guilty as if I didn't have them. That's a lot of baloney. It is the depth of our corruption that intensifies and makes worse our behavior is because we're just going to do it all over the place unless that innate corruption isn't somehow crucified and subdued. That's the end of point number three. David doesn't step back and minimize his sin in those five ways. He intensifies his guilt, which is simply amazing to me. Oh, how much healing there is that way. Seems like the opposite. You can make life worse for yourself by calling up all these horrible conditions that make you feel more guilty because I would not be healed lightly. Last point, number four, is uh, David, this is his fourth way of responding to his sin. Um, The first way was he turns helpless to God's mercy. Second way, he prays for forgiveness and cleansing. Third way, he confesses the depth and greatness of his sin and corruption. Now, here's the the fourth thing that he does. He pleads for renewal. David wants more than forgiveness, way more. I hope you do. This is why those guys on the street couldn't buy it. The only construction they had of the gospel, and I couldn't break them in 20 minutes, was you forgive him, he's just going to keep doing it. The idea that when a person is born again and forgiven of sins, they are passionately committed to being changed by God. And that's what the rest of this sermon is about. David manifests six passionate ways that he's committed to being changed by God. The mark of being forgiven is a passion to be changed. The mark of the new birth is a passion to be changed. I worry about Christians who are not passionate to be changed. I worry about them. I don't settle that they're not Christian. Life is too complex for that. It's not my call, but I worry about them. 